Hey, Steve Mignogna here, and you're watching the Steve Mags Muscle Car Show podcast. And I'm holding up this 1972, um, what, Buddy Baker K&K Insurance Charger. Yep, we're still in the Dodge section of my 2013 book, Steve Mignogna's 1001 Muscle Car Facts. And um, as you probably know by now, this is episode 53, and starting back at episode one in October of 2021, I guess it was, uh, we began with uh, General Motors, or 2020, excuse me. Uh, we did General Motors, um, Pontiac, Olds, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to tune into those, uh, there are 52 episodes that exist. You can check them out. Uh, the last six or so are on YouTube. You can actually watch me read the book, which is fun for some folks. Uh, and the remainder before that were all audio only on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Tunes, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the thing with this, uh, adding the video element on YouTube is that as we go forward, we have another 200 and something facts to go, another 20 shows or thereabouts, I will have guests here. And uh, that's when the video part will be important. But in the meantime, follow along as I read from my, my book here. And I do want to thank our sponsors, High Octane Classics, uh, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership located at 143 Washington Street in Auburn, Massachusetts. Uh, High Octane Classics, buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. Uh, Dan Mar Marinelli and the crew there at High Octane Classics are great people. Uh, give them a call at 508-859-4515. Uh, the beauty of High Octane Classics is that we're reading about Dodges right now. They have a lot of Mopars, but if you like Pontiacs, Oldsmobiles, Chevys, and Ferraris even, they have that kind of stuff too. So give them a call if you want a, uh, a classic or a muscle car in your garage, or if you have one and you need it serviced, they can help you. Okay, let us now begin. Uh, <clears throat> we're continuing. This is fact 755, and again, this is episode 53. Uh, we're going to transition. This is still engine and drive line, but at uh, about halfway into the show, we're going to switch over to suspension and brakes. And of course, you all know that the book is divided into those subchapters. So let's start now. 755, uh, engine and drive line, Dodge style. Uh, this is about the new Hemi, which we all know and love. Designers of the 2002 Gen 3 Hemi engine started from a clean sheet of paper. As such, engineers were able to correct a key detail that frustrated Tom Hoover and the Generation 2 426 Hemi design team back in 1964. The 426 Hemi crew, restrained by a budget mandate to retain as much RB big block wedge architecture as possible to eliminate the need for tooling investments, was forced to use unusually long and heavy exhaust rocker arms to span the distance between the Hemi head's laterally opposed exhaust valves and existing RB wedge-based lifter bore pushrod trajectory. And what that basically means is the exhaust rockers were really long. The next time you see a Gen 3 Hemi, look for the prominent raised camshaft tunnel visible beneath the intake manifold. It offers mute testimony, mute testimony to the fact the Gen 3 Hemi design team got Hoover's wish, albeit four decades later. The raised cam improved the lifter pushrod trajectory and allowed the use of short, light exhaust rocker arms, which helped the Gen 3 Hemi reach high engine speeds safely. Yeah, it's true. On the new Hemi, the camshaft is farther away from the, the crankshaft, which then makes the pushrods almost, not vertical or horizontal, but kind of close. So as a result, <clears throat> what you get with the new Hemi is uh, the elimination of the need for those long exhaust rockers, which plagued the second gen 426. Again, the 426 Hemi was an outgrowth of the wedge program, so a lot of its inherent issues were transferred onto the 426. But that doesn't mean the 426 Hemi can't, we can't rev. Those things will go seven, 8,000 RPMs without too much trouble. The right valves uh, and the right springs, of course, and the right valve train stuff, and they can go 7,500 RPM, no problem. So those big rockers aren't that much of a problem. Okay, let's move on to uh, gen one Hemi information with fact 756. High production costs killed the Gen 1 Hemi after the 1958 model year, or 1959, in heavy trucks. But late in 1997, when Daimler Chrysler sought a replacement for the aging LA Series 360 Magnum for light truck and SUV applications, the playing field had changed significantly. Competing vehicle makers, namely Ford and most Asian brands, had adopted overhead cam V8 architecture for truck and SUV use. Though Daimler Chrysler engineers are known to have explored single overhead cam, 
dual overhead cam, two, three, and even four valve V8 engine configurations, the inherent benefits of the double rocker shaft hemispherical combustion chamber proved to be less costly, yet just as potent as more exotic configurations. It is true that there's an SAE paper, the Society of Automotive Engineers, that indicates um, along the way to the 5.7 Hemi, or the Magnum Hemi as they called it early on, Dodge absolutely played around with overhead cam, dual overhead cam, and multi-valve configurations, but they realized once again the, uh, the time-honored centrally located spark plug, the laterally opposed valves opening toward the center of the chamber away from the walls where they're not shrouded, and the nice straight shot ports that made the first and second gen Hemi so good was A-OK -okay to use again. And the beauty is, unlike the Ford Triton truck engine, which is a very complex thing with that big timing chain and all those pieces and parts, uh, the pushrod Hemi is a pretty basic, simple piece. In fact, if you look at the General Motors LS family, those are way more traditional wedge-type uh, engines with pushrods and, again, less parts and pieces than any Ford or Toyota overhead cam design. So, again, the good breathing of the Hemi ports and chambers uh, played in the 60s just as well as they do now. So that's why we have the Hemi once again. Okay, let's move on to more Gen 3 Hemi stuff with Fact 757. Some observers say 2003 up Gen 3 Hemis aren't true Hemis because the combustion chambers aren't pure hemispheres. It is true that some chambers, particularly those used in the 5.7 liter versions, have filled in side sections. A quick look inside any 6.1 or 6.4 liter SRT8 engine reveals more familiar open Hemi chambers with unshrouded valves that open into the center of each cylinder bore. The 1964 through 71 Gen 2 426 Hemi's huge 172 cc combustion chambers required massive piston domes to attain 10 and a quarter one and 10 and a half to one compression ratios. By reducing chamber volume on the Gen 3 Hemi to 84.9 cc's, lighter pistons with smaller, more efficient domes were possible. Truth be told, the only true hemispherical combustion chambers appeared in the Gen 1 Hemis of 1950s. The Gen 2 426 Hemi chambers were pinched slightly to reduce engine width and for easier assembly line installation. So I remember when the, when the 5.7 and 6.1 and, and 6.4 Hemis came back, a lot of, that's not really a Hemi, they're just using that name. Not true. Take one apart and you'll see. I, although it is true, if you take a 5.7 truck Hemi and a 6.4 Scat Pack Hemi, look at the chambers. The truck Hemi is kind of pinched. It's semi. It's certainly a Hemi. The rocker rounds are the same, all that stuff. But the 6.4 has a more open combustion chamber. Another thing too is on the second and first generation Hemis, the chambers are so big, the dome on the piston had, be, had to be so big to fill that dome to create compression that it resulted in a pretty heavy piston. So for the third generation, they did squash the chamber a little bit to make it so that a smaller piston with a lighter configuration could fill the chamber and make compression. But the Gen 3 Hemi is just as much Hemi as any other uh, of, of the first or second gens. Okay, more Mopar goodies. Let's talk six-pack <clears throat> with Fact 758. Dodge and Plymouth played an interesting game of seesaw with the six-pack intake manifolds. For the 1969.5 446-pack Super B, the only material was aluminum, as supplied by Edelbrock. For 1970 through 72, 446 pack availability was expanded to include challengers and chargers, and construction material gradually shifted to cast iron. By contrast, the 346 pack small block intake manifold designed for the 1970 Challenger Trans Am and sibling AAR Cuda was never rendered in anything but aluminum, also provided by Edelbrock. Apparently, Chrysler wanted to limit noise, or sorry, apparently Chrysler wanted to limit nose weight on the handling-oriented Challenger TA, of which 2,399 were built. Yeah, a lot of people may or may not be aware that the 446 pack, when it debuted in 1969 and a half on those, well, Street Racer Special uh, six-pack Super Bs and Roadrunners, used aluminum intake manifolds, but for 1970, Chrysler transitioned very quickly into iron, cast iron manifolds done by Chrysler's foundries. It looked the same, did the same job, but weighs a lot. Uh, so if you see a, a, like a Superbird um, in 1970 with a six-pack engine, chances are, if it's a correct restoration, it'll have an iron intake manifold. Uh, and certainly by 1971, the aluminum manifolds were used up, and so 71 six-pack engines virtually always have an iron intake manifold. 
Uh, by contrast, all of the 340s got aluminum. They never went to an iron manifold for the 346 pack engine, although the rumored 1971 346 pack, which never came to be, but if it did, it wouldn't be a big surprise that they might have maybe played with some prototype iron manifolds um, for the 71 346 pack, if they made any at all for uh, prototyping, but not known. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> but before we do, let us, um, oh, hang on. Yeah, let's thank our sponsors, uh, High Octane Classics, uh, which of course are the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership. They're located in Auburn, Massachusetts at 143 Washington Street. Uh, High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. Give them a call at 508-859-4515. Uh, I want to thank Dan Marinelli and the, and the people at High Octane Classics for helping to make the Steve Mags Muscle Car Show podcast possible. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> let's get into uh, intake manifold design with fact 759. <clears throat> All right. Like Chrysler and Plymouth, Dodge first applied the principles of inertia and resonant ram tuning to its 1960 models. Little known is the fact Chrysler Corporation began experimenting with tuned induction as early as 1946 and took out numerous design patents in the late 1940s. At the core of it all is the formula for calculating the optimum intake passage length for tuning at a given RPM level. The formula is L equals K divided by RPM. In this, L equals the passage length K is a constant and RPM is the desired engine speed. This was once a closely guarded secret. Turns out the constant is equal to 90,000. For example, if you want maximum resonant and inertial ram effect at 5,500 RPM, you divide 90,000 by 5,500 RPM to get 16.4. That's, that's the ideal is distance in inches measured from the intake valve head through the intake tract and ending at the plenum opening beneath the carburetor. The only hassle with ram inertia tuning is underhood packaging. The early Dodge D500 ram induction 361 and 383 of 1960 and similar Plymouth Sauto Ramic Commando, DeSoto Ram Charge Adventurer and Chrysler 300F engines, um, yes, it was tuned for boosting way down at 2500 RPM. This called for 36 inch long passages though 30 inches was selected for production castings. This explains why the early Crossram intake manifolds were so long, but they did work and highway passing torque was improved by 10% over standard engines equipped with tandem inline dual quad carburetors. So there it is, you know, I, I learned this whole thing right here when I was in Hot Rod Magazine, there was a guy named Bill Shope, who was a member of the Ram Chargers in 1959. Of course, the Ram Chargers were the Chrysler engineers who played with drag race cars on their free time, but eventually became the factory drag team in the early 60s and mid 60s and became world renowned. Well, Bill Shope told me that uh, this whole thing here, where L equals K divided by RPM, that K, that 90,000 constant that you divide out by was once highly secreted, and it's pretty cool to sit down with this guy, Bill Shope, and have him spill his guts about this whole thing. In fact, we use that data in a story I did in Hot Rod Magazine called Ramming the Rat. Uh, I had a 502 Big Block Chevy that I put into my Wilshire Shaker Nova, and I wanted to play around with ram tube lengths on the dyno. We had a Hillborn injection system on the car. So we brought Bill Shope in, we toyed around with the ram tube lengths, and what we found was that the length of the tube was like a cherry on top of the torque curve. It didn't transform the engine. But one thing that did transform the engine in a really bad way was taking the tubes off. The bell mouth at the end of the tube was crucial to airflow. Take the tube away and what happens is that the open 90 degree face of the intake manifold on those hillborns would cause turbulence and the effective opening area would shrink by 20% and you'd lose power, like 25, 30 horsepower. So the bell mouth is equally important to the length of the tubes on a Hillborn type deal. Now we know. Okay, more Ram tube info with uh, fact number 760. <clears throat> this one's a little bit long, but here we go. The early long Ram intake manifolds lacked sufficient volume and became restrictive above 4,500 RPM. To remedy the problem, in 1961, Chrysler reduced, released a modified version of the long ram with half of the internal divider wall removed to yield 18-inch runners, 
which were free breathing to about 5,500 RPM, an extra 1,000 RPMs. These units were fitted to the optional 400 horsepower version of the Chrysler 300 letter series 413 through 1964. Shorter runner lengths, tuned for higher RPM effectiveness, were also used in the Ram manifolds designed for the 1960 Hyperpack Slant 6, which had a 17-inch runner length. The 1962 through 64 Max Wedge used a 15-inch runner, and the 1964, 65, and 68 Race Hemi had a 12.4-inch runner length. Later, Dodge rediscovered V8 ram tuning with the barrel ram cast aluminum EFI intake manifold introduced in 1992 for use on the 318 and 360 Magnum light truck and SUV power plants, which had an 18 and a half inch long distance. More recently, a variety of tuned runner intake manifolds have served atop every Gen 3 Hemi truck engine made since 2003. In 2009, engineers got their cake and ate it too with the addition of a computer-controlled two-speed intake manifold for the 5.7-liter Hemi installed in the 2009 Ram pickup Dodge Durango and Chrysler Aspen. Equipped with an electronically activated valve that toggles between short to runner length for better high-speed horsepower and long runner length for enhanced low-end torque, uh, this novel active intake manifold technology has not yet been applied to Dodge passenger cars. So again, this book was written in 2013, just about eight years ago. This is 2021, and uh, I'm not so sure. I think maybe some of the passenger cars might use the two-speed intake manifold, but back in 2009, when Dodge introduced that flapper valve, uh, it was a way of getting cake and eating it too. But again, the one thing that's different about the uh, the 2000, or sorry, the 1992 up barrel ram and the modern Gen 3 Hemis is that they have, again, what we call the barrel ram type uh, configuration where the throttle body is on the front and instead of having the runners go straight up or across the engine, they, they go in a circle, like a barrel, like a spiral. That way, they don't have to worry about uh, obstructing the engine valve covers for service. And of course, the hood doesn't have a big old hole in it like they did back in the 60s for the, uh, the Hillborn injectors. Okay, now we're going to change gears. We're going to go from the book's engine and driveline section to suspension and brakes. Now, if you're new to this book, you'll know that each one of the chapters is broken up into five components, legend and lore, body and interior, engine and driveline, suspension and brakes, and finally, number crunching and press commentary, which we'll get to in a later show. But for now, let's switch from uh, engine and driveline to suspension and brakes. Here we go with fact 761 with rear axle tech. <clears throat> Was the massive Dana 60 rear axle ever offered under a four-door Dodge Coronet? Remembering that the hottest engine option for four-door Coronets with the three, was the 330-horsepower 383 four-barrel, Dodge rightfully figured the 8 and 3 quarter inch rear axle was rugged enough for the job. But in the case of the two or three 1966 Dodge Coronets that were ordered with the 426 Street Hemi and a four-speed manual transmission, assembly line workers likely chuckled as they noted the build sheet's instructions to grab a Dana 60 rear axle instead of the 8 and 3 quarter. The stodgy four-door sedan and the exotic Dana 60 axle are an odd combination, but it surely happened. Yeah, it's a fact that uh, 1966, the street Hemi was available in every body style except for the station wagon. And there's rumors that one or two of those might have been built, but, but the reality is I don't think they were factory built cars. Uh, there's a drag racer named Lee Smith who ran a car I think called the Preparation H. Uh, kind of a weird name, or was it the Iron Butterfly? Anyway, well, Lee Smith had a Hemi wagon. It was a 66 Belvedere, I think it was, but that was something he put together. He told me that himself. Um, and there's also um, Richard Petty supposedly had a street Hemi wagon, but if that even existed, it was undoubtedly something they put together uh, in their shop there in Level Cross, North Carolina. Didn't happen at Hamtramck, Michigan, almost certainly. But yeah, about two or three four-speed, four-door Hemi Coronets were built in 1966, and yeah, they all got Dana rear axles. Okay, <clears throat> let us now talk about uh, disc brakes with fact 762. Uh, a full year before the, the uh, a full year before their addition to the 1965 Dodge C body regular option list, Chrysler tested two experimental disc brake systems on a small number of 1964 Dodge 880 C body full size police cruisers assigned to the California Highway Patrol. One group used Bud four piston front disc brakes. 
The other group was fitted with four-wheel disc brakes from popular aftermarket supplier Earhart. Though the Earhart system was not seen in production, the bud design for front discs only was adopted for use on production cars. Coincidentally, the Ram Charger's 1964 and 65 Ram Rail AA fuel dragster used lightweight rear disc brakes supplied by Earhart. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, quite often, you know, I like to say that police cars are muscle cars with four doors. And it is true that in many cases, muscle car packages are extensions or evolutions of police car stuff. Because after all, you know, cop cars take the worst kind of abuse you can imagine. So they're built to be durable and to stop very effectively. So the disc brake experimentation done in 64 made its way to the assembly line for 1965. Okay, let's keep going here with some more modern stuff with the, <clears throat> the new Challenger drag packs. This is fact 763. Although we'll never see complete running Challenger drag packs for sale on the showroom floor, emissions and safety restrictions forbid it, each model year seems to be more complete than the last. The cars built in 2009 were shipped with an empty independent rear suspension cradle devoid of a differential center section and half shafts for the axle. For 2010, the stock cradle was replaced with a temporary yellow dolly with trailer tires. In the field, live axles with 8 and 3 quarter or 4 9 inch or Dana 60 types were installed with either four link or leaf spring suspension before the cars hit the drag strip. Again, this is a situation where this book was written in 2013. Uh, in the years since this book was written, the Dodge Challenger drag pack, the LC23Rs, I think they call them, have been assembled as fully drivable cars. In fact, the V10s, the 50 or so they built over oh, three years ago, the V10 drag packs and even the more recent 392s, uh, the supercharged Hellcat drag pack cars uh, were shipped to people as drivable cars, but they don't have VIN, so you will never register one for the street. If you want a nine second street car from Dodge, just buy a Demon, which is an amazing thing. But again, the drag packs started out as pushmobiles, you might call them model kits almost. It was up to you uh, in the early years of the drag pack, 2008 and 9, uh, to fill out the rear suspension. And in fact, I did an article in Mopar Muscle Magazine right around 2008 or 9. Uh, Papa's Dodge in Connecticut got a brand new 2009 drag pack in right out of the wrapper. So I went there, photographed it, and I was blown away to see this weird yellow stick axle under the back of the car bolted to the chassis, no springs, no nothing, just this goofy yellow piece of metal. And I told those guys, keep that thing, it's gonna be valuable someday because an out of the package drag pack, well, it's the rebirth of the A990. It's cool that Dodge is doing this now. And it's crazy to think here that here we are in 2021, uh, eight years after this book was written and the drag pack program is still going. So, I mean, I like to say the good old days are right now and here's your proof. <clears throat> okay, let's get on to uh, fact 764 with uh, some 1950s uh, info. Intended for NASCAR race action on paved and dirt tracks, Dodge fit the 1957 Coronet D501 with upsized parts borrowed from other product lines and sister divisions. The stock front spindles and brakes were replaced with Dodge pickup truck units and the 12 inch rear drum brakes were sourced from the Imperial line minus the Imperial's huge five on five wheel bolt pattern. The 56 Dodge D501 Coronets built in 1957s are not to be confused with lesser Dodge powered D500s of which about 400 were built with standard 11 inch drums all around. Yeah, this whole thing about Dodge NASCAR packages of the 1950s is very complex. It, in fact, it makes the 64 and 5 race Hemi sedan world look very uh, straightforward. Uh, but these D501s were very special cars. As we mentioned in the last episode, which was show 52, uh, those D501s in 1957 used Chrysler 354 Hemis, not the 325 Dodge Hemi. So they were very unique in many ways. And of course, they also used those 12 inch drum brakes from the Imperial line. Kind of cool stuff, mix and match from the parts bin to get the best result. It was done then, still done now. Okay, let's move on to fact 765. Um, okay, ever wonder why most Dodge muscle cars ride on slightly longer wheelbases than same year Plymouth offerings? It's because showroom sales competition between the two divisions was just as fierce as it was with outside models from General Motors, Ford, and AMC. 
An extra inch or two of wheelbase helped to justify Dodge's higher base sticker price while offering slightly better ride comfort. The wheelbase shuffle dates back to the early days of horse-drawn carriages when long wheelbases provided a less bumpy ride. Here are a few examples of the Dodge wheelbase shuffle. The 1970-74 through 74 Challenger has a 110-inch wheelbase, whereas the same year Barracuda has a 108-inch wheelbase. The 1968-70 through 70 Dodge Super B, with 117 inches of wheelbase, compares to 116 inches for the Roadrunner, which was very similar otherwise. And the 1968 Dart, which rode on 111 inches of wheelbase, compares to the Plymouth Valiant of the same year, which rode on a 108-inch wheelbase. So again, you know, using wheelbase as a means of separating cars in price and class was nothing new, and it certainly was done by Dodge. But as you get into the uh, K car years of 1976 up, the Aspen and the Plymouth Volare, they rode on the same wheelbase. Of course, you get into the, the, um, the those are the F cars, excuse me, the K cars of the 1980s, the front wheel drive horror show days, frankly. Uh, Dodge and Plymouth did not mess around with different wheelbases. They were all standardized by that point in time. But as you get uh, mid 70s on back, oh yes, Dodge and Plymouth helped to identify each other by different wheelbases. Okay, fact 766, a little bit of rear axle tech. Eight and three quarter inch rear axle units installed under 1965 through 72 dart performance and trailer towing models featured specific axle shafts that do not interchange with parts from larger B, E, or C body applications. They all share the same 30 spline inboard drive end and plug into all eight and three quarter center sections, but the A body shafts are forged with smaller flanges to accept the five on four inch A body bolt circle and seven sixteenth inch wheel studs. Bigger cars used half inch studs set on a five on four and a half inch bolt circle. The central brake drum register hub is also of a smaller diameter than those used on big car uh, axle shafts. So yeah, the eight and three quarter when it arrived in 65, usually behind 273 four barrel four speed cars was a revelation because before that the seven and a quarter um, punk axle which would blow up was the only thing used under A bodies. But the A bodies due to their small wheel bolt pattern uh, did use a special axle shaft and great package. So now you know, don't buy a Roadrunner axle for your dart unless you want to carry two different kinds of wheels. The bolt patterns aren't the same. Okay, final fact for episode 53. Here it is, fact 767. More on the rear axles under A bodies. A body eight and three quarter rear axle assemblies also use specific brake drum assemblies with shallow backing plates and 10 by one and a half inch diameter drums. The backing plates are stamped with less offset between the housing end and brake shoe surface. B, E, and C body drum brake assemblies are not interchangeable because the backing plates are stamped with greater offset distance between the housing end and brake shoe surface. Remember these facts when shopping for an eight and three quarter for your dart at the next swap meet. These facts also apply to Plymouth A bodies as well. Yeah, again, the, uh, the A body eight and three quarter is kind of a, a Loch Ness monster of, of rear axles. And uh, if you have a, a Dart or a Slant 6 uh, Signet or something like that, and you're putting a V8 in it, you want to get an eight and three quarter. But shop wisely, again, you want to be sure you get the, uh, the small bolt pattern. And uh, it's a little bit narrower too. They're quite different in their own ways. But the center section is the same. So if you find a 391 sure grip out of a Roadrunner, it'll fit into your 276 open differential. But the rest of the housing, uh, the drum ends, the axle shafts, they're all specific to the A body, so be warned. Well, that wraps up this episode, which is show 53 of the Steve Max Muscle Car Show podcast. We certainly want to thank our sponsors, High Octane Classics, the Northeast's largest muscle car and supercar dealership located in Auburn, Massachusetts at 143 Washington Street. High Octane Classics buys and sells and services muscle cars and exotics. Give them a call at 508-859-4515. And as always, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mignotti YouTube channel and share this with your friends. We'll be back uh, very shortly with uh, episode 54. Until then, hasta mañana.